Welcome back, everybody. Okay, so now we're going to talk about recursion on the natural numbers. So recursion and inductions always come hand by hand. Induction refers to when you're proving something and you're proving something about a number, you're allowed to assume you know you have already proved it for the previous numbers. In the case of recursion, you're defining a function. You're, and when you're defining the, fun, the, the value of the function at a certain number, you're allowed to use that you know the values at the previous numbers, right? So recursion is for defining a function, induction is for proving some property. And in both cases, you're allowed to use the previous cases. So for instance, uh, you can define the factorial function by the property that n plus one factorial is equal to uh, n factorial times n plus one. So if you already know what n factorial is, then you can figure out what n plus one factorial is. And like that, you can go through all the numbers and get all the factorials. Um, it's gonna be very useful because so far, we, don't, we only have one function on the natural numbers. We have the function n plus, which only adds one. So we, don't, we couldn't do factorial yet. We don't know how to multiply, for instance. Um, let's look at a couple of examples that are gonna be very handy in a bit. So let's consider this function. So I'm gonna define the function, this one, a sub k by recursion. So fix a number k, 17 if you want, fix it. And now define this following function. At zero, it's gonna give you k. And if you apply it at n plus, remember n plus is the same as n plus one, uh, it's gonna give you a k plus. So the previous value, what do you get? What is this function? You guys, can you guys figure it out? What this function does? Well, let's see. A k at one is gonna be a k at zero plus one. So that's k plus one. A k at two is gonna be a k at one plus one which is k plus one plus one, k plus two. And so on and so forth. Again, uh, we don't have a plus symbol yet, so this is just to understand what it's actually doing, but that's what the function is gonna do, right? So a k at n is gonna be k plus n. That's the idea. So it gives you the addition of k and n. That's the, where the a comes from. Um, Okay, so that means we can define this ak by recursion like that. Uh, let's consider this new, this other case, uh, m, m sub k, at zero is zero, and at n plus one, it takes the value of the same function, so you're defining m, m sub k, at n plus one, and to, uh, to, uh, to figure out the value at n plus one, we assume we know the value at n, and we apply a sub k to that value. So what do we get? So m k at one is gonna be uh, a k of m k at zero, which is a k of zero, because that's what this is. And then that is uh, zero plus k, that's k. Uh, m k at two is gonna be a k at m k of one. That is a k of k, which is equal to k plus k, or k times two. All right, so you guys can guess from now that what you're gonna get is that m k at n Every time we apply one more, we add k. So we are gonna get k times n. Mm -hmm. So that's a recursive definition of multiplication using addition. So we can define addition using successor and multiplication using addition recursively. Uh, good, okay, so that's how recursion works. Now, um, we need to prove it or at least uh, state a theorem that says why it works. Um, 
here's a theorem. Here is a general theorem. And it says the following. So it's the same setting as before, but now in a general setting. So suppose you have a set A, and you have an element that you call little a, and inside you have a function that goes from a to itself. This is a function f. But it says that it is a unique function from omega to a, which satisfies that on zero, on zero, it goes to a, and then on n plus one, it goes to f of the previous value. So if this one, if n went here, then you apply f, and that's where this one goes. Okay, so each one is uh, f applied to the previous one. So this is exactly a setting as the previous case, right? I guess you have it right here. So in the previous case, this one here is a, and this one corresponds to the f, right? So you apply it at n plus one, you apply it at the previous value, and you apply this class function. In this case, this one is a, and this function up here is f. Yeah, so general setting is the same as in the previous case. What, uh, what are you actually gonna get? It's gonna be, we get something very simple, h0 equals a, h1 is gonna be f of h of zero, which is f of a, h2 is equal f of h of one, which is equal f f f of a, uh, right there. So h of n is gonna be f of f of f applied n times to a, right? That's what we get. So again, this is not, uh, this is just for the intuition of how we actually get. The theorem says that there is a function that it satisfies this property. And we know it has to be this function, but um, essentially that's what it satisfies. Let me give uh, just a quick idea about the proof. Uh, we can finish it in class later. Um, the existence of such a function, you cannot define it as I said before of h of n is just iterate f n times because we don't even know what iterate, how do you say about iterate, how do you say all these things with the axioms we have. We need to define h as, as using the subset axiom. That's the only one we have to define complicated things. And we need to do it at once. We, we cannot use h to define h like in the theorem, it's that's why it's recursive, it uses itself in its own definition. We have to give one definition for h. And the definition is going to be this one right here. So we're going to define h. So h is going to be the set of pairs n comma let me see n comma a that belong to omega times uh, a. Remember, this we are defining the graph, right? I mean, a function is is given by its graph. So a pair, the fact that the pair n comma a belongs to h is the same thing as saying that h of n equals a. That's what we mean by that. And when is that h of n is going to be a? Such that this. Uh, there exists a function g that goes from 0 all the way up to n, so meaning uh, goes from n plus 1, meaning that, to that the set of uh, 0 to n, to a such that satisfies the following things. So such that satisfies two things, uh, g of zero equals little a for every i in n, so less than or equal to n, um, 
no, sorry, sorry, for every i in n, uh, yes, h uh, g of i plus equals f of g of i. So, so far we're just saying that g behaves the same way as h should, be, should behave. The only difference so far being that g is defined only up to n plus 1 and it's not defined all the way through, which is harder to define because in this case it's just a finite thing. And we're going to ask for one more thing and is that uh, g of um, g of n equals a. And that's our definition. Maybe I should do it here too. Okay, so I'm defining the function h very explicitly instead of all the pairs for which there exists is finite function with domain only that only goes up to n such that it behaves the way it should behave such it behaves the way h should behave but only up to n plus 1 okay so we can define this h by uh, the subset axiom because we have omega times a so all good but then we need to claim two things so then we need to claim uh, two things so one is that for every n, there exists a g satisfying uh, all of this. Let's call this something. Let's call this a uh, star. And the other thing is that there is a unique such g and that right because we want also h to be a function so we don't want to have uh, two a's here so if you have two different g's we may have two a's here that satisfy these so we need to show there is a function so that the g is unique and also that such a g exists for n for every n so then we can actually have a function with domain uh, the natural numbers. Okay, so how are we going to prove these two things? By induction. So we need to uh, sum what device is set and then show that it's inductive. Uh, and we're going to use two inductions, one for each case. Um, we'll do it. We'll do it in class if you have time. I will also recommend you guys try it. Try it before class. Try to do it yourself and uh, see how it goes. Question for you guys. Can we define, so we define the function addition and multiplication using recursion. Can you define the exponent function? The function that given n outputs k to the power of n. How about that? Exponent, exponential function. And what about n factorial, which is shown in the first slide? Try to do those by recursion. Okay, so we define addition, that's a sub k. We define multiplication and we know they exist. We can also define order. A, a number is less than another if it belongs to it, because remember, because of the way we define the numbers, each one is a set of all the previous ones, so this just works. So that defines arithmetic. So this gives us um, the natural numbers. That gives us all we want, right? So we have the natural numbers, we have a zero, we have plus, we have times, and we have less than, and I guess we have one. That's standard model of the natural numbers. Um, once you have this, you need to show that it satisfies all the right properties because we only define them some way recursively, but we don't, we don't know anything. We know anything because we know the math from before, but we don't know it inside. So you need to prove inside the system with the actions that we have so far that we have associativity for addition and for multiplication, uh, commutativity for addition, for, multipli for multiplication. Let me uh, write down what these things are. So this is at a plus b 
plus C, where you put the parentheses, it doesn't matter. Uh, commutativity says that the order of the products the, um, of the summons doesn't matter. Oh, that's distributivity, you all know very well. A times B plus C equals D plus And addition is preserved by order. Oh, order is preserved by addition, order is preserved by multiplication. So if A is less than B, uh, then a plus c is less than b plus c and a times c is less than a times c this one is in, requires c different than c from the last one okay so uh to know that you can use these guys these, these definitions that we use by recursion you need to prove all these things uh they are there in the textbook uh, you can see some of these proofs they all go by induction on one of the guys, sometimes it's in double induction, first in one and then in the other. So they are all inductive proofs. That is something is true in the previous case, you prove in the next one. They are all quite straightforward and a bit tedious, um, but none of them is particularly difficult. Okay, so once we have this, we have all the natural numbers. So now we know that these uh, weird sets that we define, empty set that contains the empty set, that are representing the numbers, actually define a structure that behaves exactly like the natural numbers that we all that we already knew. So we can pretty much assume these are the natural numbers and just work with them. So now whenever we talk about the natural numbers we mean these particular sets but uh, they behave like the same as the natural numbers so there's nothing to worry about. Alright, see you guys next week.